it's been a long journey, but here we are. The season, excuse me, series finale. Something like that should in and of itself carry serious hype. Every plotline comes together, all setups are paid off, one more test for the heroes, one last epic clash between the forces of justice and villainy, followed by a bittersweet farewell to the cast we've grown to adore along our shared time. That would be something to expect in a competent story. But this is High Guardian Shite. The one, the only, the meme, the legend. So all I'm expecting at this point is one last crescendo of absolute madness. Come on, show. Do your worst. The villains make their decisive move and launch an attack on the High Guardian Academy to wipe out anyone privy to their existence and in the know about the rot. Take care not to draw attention to yourselves or which country. Leave no one to tell the tale. The top priority is not to draw attention, so the best course of action is once again to signal your existence as obviously as possible by bringing in an unhinged murder aficionado with all the restraint and subtlety of cookie monster in a biscuit buffet. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You may be wondering where Olive has been hiding for the last couple of episodes. And the answer is quite simple. At the Academy, right under the hero's noses, same as before. The villains know exactly how retarded the heroes are, they know that no one will notice the black cat sneaking around, even though that would be the one thing every single one of their enemies would be laser focused on, since that's what it says in the script. Olive is just free to camp out at the attic, move about in broad daylight, sneak inside dorms, read Rosemary's diary when she's out murdering dragons, I cannot believe how many dogs Rosemary drew in her diary. Ah, <sighs> that makes way more sense. Swords. Hundreds of badly drawn swords. Paid and produced comedy gold. So judgy. What are you, my father? Answer me. Meow. Ah, <sighs> just checking. Wait, Kino is a cat, right? Like a cat cat. Just a cat. And Olive is someone who can shift between her cat form and human form using her Terra Sphere. But is she originally a human or a cat? She did ask if Kino fucked her mom. Or is Kino a man originally? Someone who is cursed to live as a cat or something? I honestly can't make heads or cat tails about any of this. Oh, I know it's a joke, but since the gag falls flat like all the rest, my mind immediately drifts to the logistics of the world instead. And speaking of kitty-related business, where is Nepicat during all this? Shouldn't he be on the lookout for suspicious feline activity around the academy, same as before? Well, that's the thing. Nepi disappears from the show outright after episode 9. The bandstand is the last we see of him. My theory is that he got caught up with the wrong kind of crowd after too much merrymaking, and some sick spinster ended up making all their fantasies into reality by turning him into a hulk-sized sex ornament in their apartment smelling like cat piss. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. No! Moving along. Due to Olive's incompetence as an assassin, the faction of evil sent in the tactical genius known as Mandrake, the job is simple, Olive points out everyone who knows about the rot, Mandrake sneaks up on them, shishka pops them, easy peasy, the lemonade is already in the glass. And yet, the show manages to make everything needlessly complicated. Again, for some reality mangling brain diarrhea everyone in this show is a fucking retard reason, the villains stand up on the balcony, just observing the goings on, in clear view of anyone who happens to look outside through the enormous windows. And for some reason, the dumbass duo are wearing school uniforms. 
What exactly is the point of the disguise? Think about it. Use a single fraction of a second to actually process the happenings on screen. This is a highly exclusive, specialized academy with a tiny student count. New students are made into a huge deal. Everyone knows everyone by face. What are these disguises going to accomplish when anyone laying eyes on them will only have questions about who the hell they actually are? If confronted by either student or teacher, the school uniform disguise will fail instantly since teachers know exactly who their pupils are and the students will be intrigued by the new arrivals, ask around and get suspicious since no one has any idea where these two came from. Or at least that's how things would turn out in any reality where every single character doesn't use their skull as a storage room for their supply of nuts for the upcoming winter. It would actually be less conspicuous if these two dressed up as normal. That way they could pass off as graduated guardians on a visit or something like that. Why is Olive standing there out in the open in her human form anyway? It's not like she needs to physically point out the girls to Mandrake. Every single target can be described with Skittles colors. There is no reason for Olive to be present for the mission. She is only a liability. If any of the girls get even a glance at her, all hell will break loose. And Mandrake has the ability to shapeshift into anyone by the by. He could just waltz in and stab everyone disguised as a member of the triad. Who are all out of town. Something the villain should be aware of. Since they have Olive stationed at the academy for the specific purpose of espionage. It's so obvious, so simple and clean. Mandrake's spell activates in an instant, requires no Terra Sphere, nor old magic runes. Actually, that goes for most of his spells. Half the time the magic just poofs into reality, and other times Mandrake whips out a Terra Sphere. So that's yet another inconsistency. They just keep coming and coming and coming and coming and Once again, the villains have a laughably simple victory just handed to them and yet they immediately start bumbling towards their inevitable doom. Mandrake decides to troll Rosemary, masquerades her mom and lures her into a trap. The tactical genius assassin just stands out in the open as THE High Guardian Lavender, the most famous person in all the academy. Does the Triumvirate hire every single one of their underlings from some kind of special needs program? And of course none of the teens notice the fully armor clad celebrity guardian, except for Rosemary, the specific target. Because everyone in this school is either blind, or moron, or that's just what it says in the script. I... What? What? I knew you were alive! Where were you? Are you okay? I want to tell you everything, but later. There are enemies in the school. And you can't tell anyone that I'm back. Well, not even my friends. I tell them everything. I tell them... Not even them. Now. Tell me what you and your friends know about the rot. Was that what your mission was about? Ours, too. Well, unofficially. Do you know what's causing it? No. <gasps> Do you know? It's my mission to find out. Wait, so have you been on this mission the whole time? Or other missions, too? Later, Rosemary. Who else knows about it? Well, Sage. Oh, she's gonna want to see you. Oh, and Time and Parsley. You have to meet them. I look forward to it. Go on. Uh, Snapdragon and Amaryllis, well, maybe our enemies in Witch Country, and something called the Triumvirate. They're after us. For some reason, Mandrake starts grilling Rosemary about who else knows about the rot. Why? Olive should already know everyone who knows. That's the whole reason to have her around. If Mandrake is going to do Olive's job for her, then there was never any reason to keep her alive after her first failure back at the festival. 
But basically, the plot reason for this conversation, instead of instant stabity stab, is to build up tension. Oh my goodness! Is the villain who was introduced five whole minutes ago seriously going to kill the protagonist? We can always hope, but I know in my heart of hearts that's not going to happen. Oh, Professor Caraway. Professor Caraway? Yeah, your best friend Caraway. I saw him writing about it in his journal. And, well, who knows who else he told? You should ask him. Mom? Mom! Where'd you go? Somehow this is new information. Olive has been reading Rosemary's diary. Has she not written anything about the dragon incident? About who was involved? How Caraway did all that he could? Which was basically fuck all. And that she was forced to end the creature's suffering? Nothing? Is the diary just about shit doodles and... Hundreds of badly drawn swords. Yes, that. Anyway, how convenient is it that Mandrake just so happened to postpone the stabbing just long enough that Rosemary could share this vital info with him? First the tactical genius grills all the info he can get out of the target, then he goes in for the kill, then the target suddenly remembers new information, and instead of grilling them some more... Are you sure that this is the last person on the list? No one else knows? Are you absolutely sure there's not an entire community of merfolk who got their beloved friend killed because of the rot? Nothing silly like that. He just vanishes to trails unknown and leaves the current job unfinished. The point was to keep low profile. And now one of the targets is left very much alive and on high alert because of your obviously suspicious behavior. Or at least they would be on high alert. If this was anyone except Rosemary, the densest heroine I've ever witnessed. All of this is so utterly contrived that it actually hurts my soul. I don't believe for a second that Rosemary wouldn't recognize her mom for a fake. This woman is her obsession. It's the one thing that defines her. Her alleged bond to her mother. The rewrite is obvious. Rosemary figures out the deception right away. Something Lavender says is off. She misremembers conversations between her and Rosemary. The way she acts is iffy. The contrast would of course require Lavender to actually have a personality. Beyond woman with a sword. But you get what I mean. If Rosemary saw through the ruse, played it cool and managed to escape from Mandrake. Thus foiling his initial plan. That would actually work as a satisfactory payoff for the constant mentions about Lavender. Of course the heroine recognizes the fake mom in front of her, are you kidding? In a perfect world, a moment like that could even be quite sweet. Or badass, depending which way the writer decides to have it play out. As it currently is, the scene only further portrays the main heroine as a worthless airhead. Nothing about this is suspicious. Suddenly your mom is back, suddenly she disappears, she herself told you that there are enemies on the school grounds, excellent tactical choice there by the way you goddamn idiot, and still she abandons you. None of this makes you the least bit concerned. For fuck's sake, your mom reacted to the mention of Professor Caraway as if she'd never even heard the name before. Are you actually this retarded? But it doesn't matter anyway, because Rosemary immediately tells the rest of the girls that her mom is back. Even though she specifically told her not to. Where have you been? Oh, I... I'm not allowed to tell you. You have my full attention. Since when do you keep secrets? Since my... Rose? I can't tell you... I cannot listen to this all day. Parsley, gospel, or gauntlet? Gauntlet! Okay. Tickle Rose until she spills the beans. <laughs> I saw my mom! Wait, you did? Are you joking? Where is she? I, I don't know. I mentioned Caraway. She disappeared. <gasps> Caraway's office! Think about it. 
The villain assumes that the heroine respects their parents enough to be able to keep an important secret. But this is Rosemary. And she is... She is a special kind of hero. The girls head to Caraway's office, where Mandrake meets them in the guise of Professor Tex-Mex. And as one might guess, the tactical genius forgets the number one rule of shapeshifter infiltration. Always make sure that the original is dealt with, so that they don't just suddenly walk in, and you end up with this hackneyed Mexican standoff. And just to underline how first drafted this script is, these two scenes happen right after the other. Absolutely nothing is gained by the first scene, except for the entire cast once again coming off as morons. Nothing transpires between Rosemary not realizing Mandrake's ruse and him getting found out anyway, so there is no reason why these two events couldn't be combined. Just have the girls walk in the office on whatever pretense, homework or something, build the tension with the fake caraway instead of lavender, and the rest of the scene can unfold exactly the same. That way, what little shreds of authenticity Rosemary's character has left will remain intact, and the villains won't seem quite so incompetent. Streamlining is good whenever your story can afford it. But when your show is 70% filler anyway, I guess proper use of screen time never was a priority. Who is the real Caraway? Sage, fire on the first one of us that moves. He's trying to manipulate you. Be cautious. Pop quiz, what epic monster were you fighting when Flowering Thorn broke? <laughs> nice. See, he doesn't know. Disarm him. Answer the question. I don't know, a dragon. Yeah! This is a concussive blast. Why would the assassin, whose goal is to assassinate everyone, ever use a concussive blast when his primary method of attack are sharp, lethal, magical blades? Plot armor doesn't cut it at this point. This is a plot wall. Anyway, the villain is exposed. It's done. The evil forces have failed. Again, unless Mandrake kills everyone in this room, right now, which is highly unlikely, there is absolutely no way this farce can continue. Go after him, go after him, go after him, why aren't you going after him, stop him, go after the villain, stop talking and chase him, stop talking you idiots, there is a murderous villain on the loose, he is literally going to kill everyone, why are you still talking, stop, stop it, shut the fuck up and go after the villain, I can't believe you are still talking, who wrote this, you all deserve to die horribly, at this point, the heroes and villains are just competing for the title of Apex Retard. Stop talking, you useless cunts, and do your job! Don't alert the other students. I'll gather the teachers. You girls, stay together. Don't engage and don't alert the other students. Don't alert the students. Everyone just saw you mega lasering some rando through the window! And you utter muppet actually believe that the entire school isn't going to be alarmed whether you want it or not. Not to mention that this crisis would already be over if you had just done your job. And Caraway sends the girls away to do fuck all while he alone organizes the teachers to catch Mandrake. No, you endless tempest of brain farts. The girls are the only ones you can trust at this point. You can be sure that none of them are the enemy. Anyone else might be the shapeshifter at this point. You have to move as a group. Keep taps on one another so that you maintain your advantage and make sure the enemy won't get the drop on you. Splitting up is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. You don't have to be a genius to figure this stuff out. This is so simple even a toddler could handle it. The dumb just won't stop coming and coming and coming and coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. After all this time, 
I'm still struggling to accept that this is the actual standard of writing we are dealing with. It honestly feels like a fever dream. No one stopped this from happening. No one thought this needed fixing. Every single person working on this story is an insane moron. Your head must be filled with sewage to look at this fuckness and notice nothing wrong with it. Absolutely no event leads logically to the next, and every single hero is a despicable, negligent, glue-sniffing, lollygagging, infuriating nincompoop. I'm unironically rooting for the villains to murder everyone. The protagonist, her extended gaggle of fools, and this whole ludicrous academy are too stupid to exist. They do not deserve the air flowing through their lungs. If you manage to write characters that bring out this amount of loathing from the audience, you know you've created something truly special. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.